Hello everyone. Uh, the microphone. Is it working yet? Yeah. It isn't. Okay, just for the recording. Um, so, hello everyone, sorry for the delay. I am Francois Tijot and I will talk about PostgreSQL and how we used PGBench to benchmark, to check and improve the scalability of the Dragonfly BSD operating system. Uh, so, I'm an independent consultant and sysadmin a former CCTLD C engineer. I work in the .fr registry. Uh, I have been a BSD and PostgreSQL user for a long time. I have introduced <coughs> FreeBSD for the name servers of the .fr registry. And I have been a Dragonfly developer for a few years now. Uh, Dragonfly BSD is a Unix-like operating system based on FreeBSD. It was forked um, in 2003 by Matthew Dillon from FreeBSD4. Um, there were many goals at the beginning, but the most important one are about performance, multiprocessor scalability. And for that, Dragonfly uses per-core replicated resources and messaging. Um, it is a bit different from most of the other Unix-like operating systems. It doesn't use complicated algorithms. And by using replicated resources per core, per logical core on hyper-threaded machines, many operations are naturally lockless. Um, Dragonfly has a few innovative features which can be very useful for some workloads and in particular database loads. Uh, for example, we have Swap Cache, which is a second level file cache using the swap infrastructure and optimized for SSDs. This is the relative PostgreSQL performance with and without Swap Cache. Uh, the blue curve it was um, uh, registered on the um, workstation with a limited amount of memory uh, by someone wanting to map and process maps for a good chunk of the North American continent. Uh, he used the OpenStreetMap project, if I'm not mistaken. And his machine just couldn't keep up. Keep up. It didn't have enough memory. But by using swap cache, he was able to just buy a small SSD and process all the amount of mapping data he wanted to with a much less severe performance degradation. Uh, basically, he avoided to buy a new workstation and only had to spend about $300 instead of $3,000. Um, I will now talk about the PGBench usage and what I did historically in details. Uh, the first PGBench runs were made in November 2011. At the time, Dragonfly, the last stable release of Dragonfly, still had a big uh, multiprocessor lock and we just removed it in the development version. Um, I had the occasion to use a dual ZM machine which could run 24 hardware threads and I was looking for benchmarks which could show the improvements in multiprocessor scalability from the development version to the stable from the stable version to the development version. So PGBench was a good fit. PGBench is Postgres specific uh, it can be used in different ways. There is a read-only workload which is very useful for showing multiprocessor scalability and this is the one I used. It doesn't touch, touch file systems. Well, it does use file systems, but it doesn't touch disks directly. 
all five systems operation can be made from memory. And we don't have the problem of higher bottlenecks uh, polluting the benchmark results. Um, we had some problems immediately from the start. At high loads, the Dragonfly kernel crashed. We had some weird bugs, name cache bug, for example, where some files were supposed to exist but couldn't be found by PG Bench, for example. Um, these bugs were fixed quite quickly, generally in less than a day. It was mostly a matter of uh, writing the right uh, lock directives in the kernel. We had deadlocks in the VM subsystem, overflows in memory allocation subsystems, races, uh, well, all of this was generally locking problems and were exposed by the removal of the big multiprocessor lock. They were relatively obvious to fix. So, uh, for comparison purpose, I'll also use Scientific Linux, which is a sort of a Red Hat Enterprise derivative. So, for server workloads, I thought it was uh, a good fit. We have Dragonfly in the bottom, the stable version, and Scientific Linux, which is obviously doing much better. Um, we immediately found many bottlenecks, and changes were made just uh, in the days following the first results. Uh, we found we have another big multiprocessor lock in the System 5 semaphore code. System 5 um, shared memory segments are used by Postgres, were used by Postgres in this version. So this was a very important fix, that subsystem. Uh, we had bottlenecks in select, pull, many performance issues in memory allocation path. And we had to fix the VM subsystem, the virtual memory subsystem, to improve um, um, the number of page faults we could process at one time. Um, Postgres uses big memory shared, a big shared memory segment, so it exercises memory allocation code passes, virtual memory code passes, and uh, well. We will keep finding problems. We will keep finding problems in these subsystems for a long time. So after the first improvements, Dragonfly 2.13 was here, sort of intermediate between Linux and the original stable version. Um, the new development version of Dragonfly could more or less scale according to the amount of physical cores. Um, and still had problems after some time. Uh, then, a few years later, I had access to another dual Xeon machine. I decided to run new benchmarks with a new Postgres version, new Dragonfly versions, and uh, basically, I ran benchmark other peop and found bottlenecks in the kernel. Other people fixed them or made tweaks to the kernel. And this was a constantly um, running process. We were communicating on IRC mainly, so as not to lose too much time. But it still took a very long time to, to run all the benchmarks and uh, do all the improvements. So at first, we had Dragonfly 3.0, which was already using the improvements from the previous development version. But it was much, much worse than a Linux-based operating system used as a reference. 
And one of the problems was the new version of PostgreSQL used a different shared memory allocation technique. It didn't use System 5 shared memory segments anymore. Um, Postgres now used MMAP. Um, nobody loves System 5 shared memory. Uh, many operating systems still have defaults straight from the 1980s, whereas you can allocate more than a few megabytes of memory by default. So people have to tune their system to use this control, possibly recompile the kernels on some machines, on some systems, and this is a big mess. So that's why Postgres people are trying to use MMAP by default and move away from system file shared memories. Um, after some time, we still identified many bottlenecks and improved kernel performance. So Dragonfly 3.2, which was the next stable version, was much improved and more or less on par with the reference Linux-based system. Uh, for the details of the improvement, we had one bright uh, summer of code student uh, add CPU topology awareness to the kernel. Uh, the all BSD scheduler was changed to take this information into account. Knowing the machine topology is very important on new multiprocessor systems. New MP machines are not symmetric anymore. They are NUMA for a shot of uh, non-uniform memory access. Part of the memory is allocated to one processor, part of the memory to another one. The different processors communicate with I.O. subsystems or memory differently. And most importantly, each processor or each core in a processor socket as its own individual hardware resources. So we have to know when to migrate processes, when or when not to migrate them, so as to keep caches hot. And this is very, very important for performance. Um, we found out the original BSD scheduler, even when it had the topology information, still had significant bottlenecks. It itself was single threaded and had to be rewritten. So Madeleine wrote a new scheduler. Uh, it, schedules it schedules processes as close as possible to the place they were last run on to keep catches hot. To, keep, to also keep translation look aside buffers hot. Um, TLBs are sort of caches for the virtual memory hardware subsystems. So it's very important when you use huge amount of memory to keep these caches as hot as possible. Uh, we also, on the other hand, we also try to avoid unnecessary competition for resources. When we have two processor sockets with huge amount of cache per socket and only two Postgres clients, for example, it doesn't make sense to run the two Postgres clients on the same socket. It's best to run one on the first socket and the other one on the other socket for you double the amount of cache memory effectively used. So there are many trade-offs we have to know, we have to make. Um, this is the same kind of problem between individual cores on each processor socket and hyper threads on the same CPU core. Uh, so we have to keep caches out, but also globally balance the load and uh, try to avoid hotspots and uh, performance bottlenecks on a particular hardware resource. Um, there were also other improvements. We found out many default values were tuned for 32-bit machines. In particular, the amount of file cache memories we could use and so on. Uh, so we changed that. Um, yeah, virtual memory was also 
a big problem because it itself has to use page tables, which are in-memory descriptive resources <coughs> used to describe where a virtual address points to. So by using, for example, 32 gigabytes of virtual memory, we have to manage possibly hundreds of megabytes, even gigabytes of page tables just to describe where in the physical world these virtual memory pages are located. So um, we had to do something, and that something was uh, called PMAP MMU optimization. Um, basically, the kernel tries to keep some of the page descriptive tables common between different processes. I'm not sure if I'm very clear on that part. Well, we try to avoid duplication in the page tables. Uh, possibly avoiding the use of gigabytes of even tens of gigabytes of memory when you have a huge Postgres shared memory segment. And finally, uh, we also found out we could directly read file data from the VM cache subsystem. So that's a so-called read shortcut. Um, this graph shows a few of the improvements individually. So this was the base Dragonfly 3.0 performance. By using shared page table information, we already improved performance tremendously. Reading file data directly from the virtual memory cache help us improve performance even better. And finally, the new scheduler is the green curve. And gives us something which was more or less equal to the Linux performance. So. We also found out after a while these performance improvements were not Postgres specific and many workloads were improved. Uh, in general, the number of multiprocessor virtual memory invalidations was much reduced. So the bigger the machine, the less it has to wait for other processor to process virtual memory mapping uh, information. Uh, file operations were much improved with the red system call. And generally, the more the machine was loaded, the less it had to wait. So we have across the board improvements, performance, and all load. I recently had the occasion of running Postgres benchmarks again. Uh, this time it was on a 40 hardware thread machine, also dual ZN, uh, in March of this year. Um, we didn't really do any Postgres uh, specific performance improvements this time. It was just to check uh, if Dragonfly was still <coughs> performing adequately with recent PostgreSQL versions. Uh, we found out we still had some improvements, but this time they were most likely caused by improvements we had to make for running Poudrier, which is the FreeBSD-based package building system created by Batiste, which is here. Um, this is, um, Rear is very processor, fork exec, and IO intensive. It really exerces all kinds of uh, kernel subsystems. So, um, we found out we were no better than Linux for much of the curve. Dragonfly is in green. Um, for reference, you have two Linux-based operating systems, Debian and uh, CentOS. Uh, Dragonfly is faster than Linux, 
and scales better than Linux as long as you have available hardware resources. Performance degradation is a bit more severe than Linux once you have more Postgres clients than hardware resources, but this is uh, known. Um, we are well. We wanted to to keep interactive performance. Um, to not degrade too much interactive performance and download. So this must severe degradation than Linux once hardware resources uh, are gone. Avoids, well, it's a consequence of wanting to avoid waiting for 15 seconds after you have typed a key, for example, and see the result on the screen. So this is a compromise. So I'm done. If you have any questions. Um, so the swap cache, that is just more instead of uh, um, it's like a file system cache. Okay. So the swap cache, that is more of a file system cache so that when you have a spinning disk, instead of reading it again from the spinning disk, you actually read it from the SSD as opposed to just putting swap on it, correct? Uh, that's more or less the idea. Well, a swap cache is a sort of second level file cache and it uses the swap infrastructure. Um, it really puts cache data on, in the swap area. It can be used with regular hard disk if you're really disparate, you can improve performance a bit, well, like if you add more disks in a red spool. But it's really optimized for SSD. Um, it has a um, write amount target. It tries to not write too much data at the same time, so as not to wear out the SSD. And once the cache has been populated, it starts to read back pages directly from this cache instantly. So, yeah, the idea is really to use it more as a read cache and not to wear out SSDs. Um, you can have hundreds of gigabytes of uh, second level file cache that way. So, kind of similar to the L2R on CFS then. But well, I, it's, I, I know the implementation is differently because it's part of the operating system versus... Yeah, and uh, well, uh, ZFS does things differently. And if I'm not mistaken, ZFS uses SSDs for write caching. Uh, so ZFS has both L2ARC, which is mm -hmm. effectively a read cache yeah. for the main data set, but then there's also the ZIL which is mm -hmm. the intent log writing, which is separate. So you actually have both effectively a write cache and a read cache through two okay. different mechanisms. Yeah, so that one is mostly a read cache. Um, you can do almost everything with it. Uh, we have specific file attributes you can use to, um, if you want to decide to put in cache only a subdirectory hierarchy, you add this file attribute um, to the directory you want to cache. You can try to only cache file metadata. You can cache file concerns. Well, all kinds of variations are possible. And this is controlled by syscontrols and uh, file attributes. So I'm going to get a bit sidetracked, obviously. So you mentioned uh, Poudrier workloads. Did yeah. you notice anything uh, really interesting? Like, I know that it's all over the place, but uh, is there something which is uh, mm -hmm. more obvious to optimize looking at uh, Poudrier workloads? Uh, well, the problem is Poudrier exercised all kinds of um, kernel subsystems at the same time, yeah. and we add really, really weird bugs. Uh, for example, we had a REST condition in the TTY subsystem. Just by trying to do a LS or 
print what was happening on the screen at the same time Pudria ran, we had a kernel panic. Ouch. Yeah, and I think most kernels have these kinds of, bug, of bugs, but only Pudria was able to exercise so many subsystems at the same time so as to make them obvious. Um, most of the problems were in the virtual memory subsystem, the I.O. subsystem, file reading, mostly reading, yeah. Um, directory access, name cache, um, multiprocessor by itself was already a problem. Having so many processes run at the same time, we had locking issues in uh, some part of the kernel, like uh, uh, really exercise system calls. Uh, for example, well, we had read. I think we had uh, select or some common subsystems which had locking problems, but no program was able to make them obvious before Prodrier. So. Yeah, I know the, I know the feeling, but uh, mm. nothing obvious to improve, just. Uh, so it was everywhere. And the bulk of the bugs and the issues were in the virtual memory and uh, name cache subsystem, if I um, remember incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Welcome. So I know that this kind of benchmarking is uh, quite time consuming and mm -hmm. requires a lot of effort. Um, so I sort of have a two-part question. The first part is um, I'm wondering if you uh, intend to do another round of uh, investigation um, um. of Postgres specifically um, at some point in the future. And secondly, um, mm. have you given thought to uh, methods of automating this sort of benchmarking <coughs> or uh, some sort of way that uh, mm. it could be run on an ongoing basis? Because I think mm. one of the tricks is uh, it's, it may not be, um, if, if you're not directly following an upstream project like Postgres in this case, when, mm. the, mem, uh, when the MMAP switch changed, yeah. it may not be immediately obvious, oh, 9.2 mm. to 9.3 may be a, an important point yeah. to do a, um, a huge benchmarking run, right? So I'm, I'm not sure how, uh, how to effectively find out when these sorts of regressions happen against upstream mm. projects. Yeah, um, that's a problem. Well, actually, automating this benchmark and running continuously is not difficult. Um, I already automated it uh, when I ran, uh, when I collected the data points. Um, each point was made from three different measures, and I had to run uh, the benchmark many times, at least three times for each operating system and each point. Uh, so I created a shell script and uh, ran it uh, automatically for um, for the entire um, x axis uh, x axis yeah uh, so automating this kind of benchmarks is not difficult uh, the problem is more about big machines availability um, every time I run this, bench this benchmark. I had a dual ZN system available for at least a week uh, before it could be put into production. So, so that, that was really um, an opportunity. Uh, I'm, we could do run this kind of benchmark continuously, but we had to buy a machine uh, specially dedicated for it. Uh, okay. So is is the but. The the installation of the OSs and everything was still relatively manual for your testing? Or did um, you the installation of the OS is not a problem for we can prepare a disk and just plug it in into the machine uh, uh, when you want to run the benchmark. So this can be done offline in a way. Yeah, um, part of the reason and only run read-only benchmarks as uh, trying to use disks for measuring PostgreSQL read and write disk performance would have taken much, much more time.
Any more questions? Well, thank you, Anna.